<laughs> so we have uh, Marvin Gottke who's joining us from uh, Berlin and uh, yeah, Paul who's in between London and New York. Thanks. So thank you for having us. Um, well, thanks for the nice introduction as well. So um, this is Paul, um, I'm Marvin. Um, together um, we're working at a collaborative uh, research studio um, called like us, Bart Bratke, and um, therefore res research basically um, uh, it reaches out over the traditional definition of an architecture practice. So we explore building strategies um, at, this, uh, at the interface of mobility, emerging technologies, dynamic foresight, and these are always combined um, with human-centered design. And lately, we also realized um, that we want to put an ecologic component actually in our office, so we only or we scan the projects, we do very much about um, that they fulfill one of the 17 UN sustainable development goals. So many of the projects that you will see in the presentation are always um, aimed to um, apply to one of these goals. Uh, this is actually a slide we have from another presentation, but I thought it was interesting to integrate it and maybe also for the audience just to cross-check it um, as well. It comes from a book from Andrew McAfee. And we always call our studio, um, not architectural studio, but for architectural systems. And um, um, we would like to see architecture as a machine, as a platform, and as a crowd. So the lecture gives an overview of um, past and current streams of architecture and ties basically our studio works into the larger context. So we will take a look at the notion of architectural systems from um, three different views, the ones that you um, see over here. So we will cover um, notions of automations and working at the interface of new modes of mobility that can um, activate architecture and make it rather working as a platform. So it could become an enabler for crowd-based solutions and a participatory or more participatory environment. So the studio um, is split up into research and commercial works. That's also something that many of the studios presented here today um, had in common. Um, the lecture will more highlight our research projects, but also show some commercial work because um, the basis of this is that we try to research in smaller scale prototypes before applying it into larger scale architectures. So always bits and pieces that we research in small scales are later on applied to the larger scale. We are um, usually engaged um, with um, factors of temporality, autonomy, uh, responsiveness, and also user engagement. And um, we always uh, take this quote as a beginning from by Otto who said like architecture um, or in German said Architektur is vermutete Zukunft. Um, he describes architecture as an anticipated future. Um, architecture that shall show visions for how our world can look in the future and give scenarios and designs to inspire future generations. So um, we take a look of how our buildings um, would have a better fit to be more adaptable um, to the ever-changing factors um, that are triggered through an um, acceleration of information um, exchange in society, um, also including um, systematic thinking and uh, circular planning processes. And to look in the future, we always uh, take a step back in the beginning. Uh, this is a scene from a short movie from the 90s 20 movie, uh, it's called One Week from Buster Keaton. And this movie um, basically shows already principles of um, systematic thinking and um, designing for adaptable architectures, um, yeah, rather in a comedic way. Um, basically the film depicts um, this new freshly married couple um, during the building process of their um, new home and all the struggles that they will encounter. So basically this movie, 
already like 100 years ago handled themes of uh, prefabrication and the uh, necessity of a more re uh, resilient architecture. So these are um, scenes from the movie. And um, here you see that actually while building this house, like forms and the functions are actually rearranged inside the house on the fly. So um, on one of the pictures you see that actually climatic change has a huge influence of the house and literally uh, makes it um, rotate, like complete facades are rearranged and become vertical circulations. And finally, um, in the end, um, when a house gets disassembled um, to its uh, building parts, this is because it is um, not mobile enough, you know, there's a moment to make the house more mobile, attaching it to a car. Um, and finally, the train runs through and it gets uh, like in a circular um, approach uh, disassembled to all of its initial parts. So only in these 15 minutes of these short movies um, from the 1920s, the viewer sees like a whole life cycle of a building with all its ups and downs, with the happiness and all the frustration. And the house is in constant movement and in constant um, reconfiguration. So. Um, to cover this a little bit more, this is like um, a slide that shows two of the main drivers of our today's society and should also cover a little bit of where we are coming from and our view on architecture. So the one is the growing access to information and um, its constant exchange and updates. The second one on the right um, shows um, a sketch from Sid Mead from the uh, 60s, I think, um, of a yeah, mobility and urban infrastructure network. If we look at cities today, this is almost like um, how it looks like in Tokyo and LA. So these will, um, or have already become in the 90s, 2000s, like huge um, factors of influence for our architecture and for our infrastructure. And this correlates um, with our background because um, we come from the background of transportation design. This is, um, a project we did like 10 years ago and we worked on these topics um, in the framework of this future mobility project where um, we for the first time experienced um, like that a car is a very complex um, part to whole relationship that um, forms a functional system when all the parts come together and in this case um, it's an autonomously driving um, electric car. So um, this is just uh, the built prototype of it, actually. So you can see uh, in the video on the left side, this is really autonomously driving. So this is um, basically our heritage, where we come from, um, and where we learned also to um, build and assemble complex parts to a whole. Um, later on, we went on um, and focused on Asian megacities, the infrastructure, and creating there a mobility system that um, connects our homes um, and individual users um, together and uh, while sharing the energy um, between the various city actors inside of the city, also thus creating a new device of mobility. So um, this is um, basically how this could look like, um, where we have this harmonious interplay between all of the factors and all of the actors in the city um, that um, integrates a mobility system completely into our daily lives. So um, the design functions actually as a platform um, that opens up as a sharing model, um, not only between people, but very important between the energy, between the different actors of the city. And you can already see this today. We had another example today um, of a Tesla and manufacturing plant. So also the Tesla battery is the first step into this um, direction. So the mode of the mobility will be much more integral part of our daily lives and integrated into our different um, urban environments. So um, as I said, we see this already today. So what we think are four really important factors for our um, common futures and for architecture as well um, are these four depicted on the slides. And um, the top left one is actually another illustration from Sid Mead who we like very much, um, it should cover electro and autonomous mobility. And Sid Mead said once, um, 
that the car of the future will actually be more like an electric horse. So it will, like when a cowboy comes out of the saloon, gets on his horse, he's obviously drunk. Yeah, the horse carries him home autonomously. It rides and stampedes um, together um, in groups. And then in the end, before going home, they split apart and the horse brings the drunk rider home. So this is basically an analogy how um, Sidmeet also thinks um, the mobility of the future works. So another trend covers um, green cities, of course, and the ban of combustion engines out of the, um, our city centers, um, as well as the analyze and the use of big data models and the integration of it into our future cities. And with that comes, of course, another problem with the common rise of e-commerce. Um, we also want to get our products in our cities, so we have a needed um, need for an increased um, logistics um, to bring them in, uh, into our city centers. And um, with all of these um, streams and future um, influences of our cities, um, we take a look back at our architecture and um, maybe it's a little step back to the um, yeah. <laughs> to Mies van der Rohe and the um, Seagram building. Um, we also had this in another lecture today mentioned. Um, we think that also the construction of this building is not so different from how we construct today, actually, um, which is a very static system. Of course, there are optimization processes and advancement in technology, but the basic building process um, is still the same than uh, like 60 years ago. And there have been um, theoretical advancements, for example, in the architectural machine group already since the 60s, since um, this age of space travel, where mainly these concepts came up, where um, completely rearranging urban models um, were investigated in. So this is um, a look at our city today. And um, also, basically, when we take a look at this uh, photo, we also see these um, age paradigms of our architecture and that our um, built environment today rather feels like a static construct. But the city, how it works today um, in our enhanced information society, um, where even bigger parts of knowledge are exchanged faster and faster, doesn't work like this anymore. So this um, creates a constantly changing um, dynamic um, and a constantly changing construct of these socio-economic streams and the city not necessarily, and our built environment cannot um, react to it. So we are looking at a more adaptable system and possible answers um, we can deliver in our architectures or in our designs. Um, as said, this is not um, completely new, like um, Archigram already like, put whole cities uh, on, on feet and made them movable. And there's a um, yeah, example of David Benjamin's early work where architecture also becomes more um, integrated, um, more reacting to um, human needs. We also see this in the work of uh, minima forms, for example, where actually more behavior is um, related to the topic of architecture, where a whole square in London through something more intangible becomes uh, used completely different with a com another over um, with another layer of information over the built um, ground. So this makes us actually thinking about um, the interaction and the communication from man to man, from man to machine, and also from machine to machine. And um, brings us to one of our studios work where we um, rather investigate in smaller scales, but with um, faster feedback loops um, our architectural agendas that apply more resilience and more adaptability um, to the user. So we use artworks and installation um, that create these forms of interaction between the human and our built environment. And uh, one of these installations is this one. And as you can see, kind of like this um, creates rather as a static architecture, a constant behavior that also changes with the interaction um, here of the human, for example. So it retracts and expands again um, while um, a human being comes in and interacts with this. Um, this is a slide that shows um, basically the construction and some of the detailings of the project um, as well. 
And part of this interaction is actually um, something that we think um, is actually rooted in human behavior and human motion itself. So we are very interested in this uh, motion and movement and constantly try to analyze how we can implement it in our architectural system. So the man-machine relation um, here can be seen um, in complex movements, for example, in this case, um, like a dance notation system from the Foresight Company, um, which were the first one to um, use a digital notation system to actually um, yeah, almost predict uh, human movement and dance. So um, we went to Frankfurt for a project and we had the lucky chance to work together with very talented um, people to create a complete interactive environment and room. So we worked together with um, Walz Binaire and um, also the sound collective uh, Kling Klang Klong, who recently uh, played the Elb Philharmonie to create um, this complete interactive room where we um, scanned dancers and motion to create um, architectural output um, that was then used to um, re-inspire actually the dancers. And um, in the end of the, the video is hanging, in the end um, of one of the cycles, actually um, the motion and uh, yeah, the dance itself and the interaction of the people who attended, um, who attended this event were basically um, 3D printed. So basically they had this um, digital fingerprint of a certain moment um, in time and everybody in the end of the event could um, take this with them. So we created um, a kind of collective memory of the interaction that was there during the day, which led us um, to another installation. Um, this case, um, it's building up on the last one of the one with the dancers, but in this uh, one, we actually um, worked together also with a sound engineer to create another virtual um, object in this time, and the users could um, interact with this virtual object. So basically, you have an ever-moving ring in the middle of the room, and everybody who comes close to it can drag parts out of the ring and can deform the ring while it's in motion. And um, of course, since this is a commissioned artwork, we also um, produced kind of an art piece. So um, what we did was, oh, sorry, that it's not working fluently. Uh, what we did was actually um, having a, intermission, um, sometimes in the interaction of the people where we scanned them and the uh, data was directly sent to a 3D printer that produced the rings and out of the rings during the exhibition um, we produced um, this column, this memory column um, of each participant um, that is partly depicted here. Um, so basically the final result of the exhibition and the art piece was heavily influenced by the visitor itself. So what you see here, when nobody would have come, basically this would have just been um, a straight circle extruded. And um, why are we doing this? Um, brings us to the next topic, um, which is called um, space on demand. And it's um, highlighting the correlation of these interactive systems um, into our architectural strategies. Um, so as uh, um, demand and dynamics of our cities change faster than our environment um, can keep up to, there's a certain need um, for these adaptive spaces and um, also flexible infrastructures. Together with the question and the idea of defining a personal space, the size and the application scenarios, um, this creates a whole new um, flexible set of um, possibilities that should actually react to a 21st century society where we are more used to a culture of sharing, um, we are more used to services on demand, a society where we are tending towards um, rather services. So basically um, the biggest um, taxi company um, of the world has no single car, the biggest hotel, Airbnb, um, has no uh, single room to offer. So we always ask the question, what does this mean actually in our architectural context? And how do we deliver systems that could uh, cater to that fact? Um, in general, one of the answers 
is um, creating building systems that are more flexible, more adaptable, and can use the space more efficiently. So um, a lot of our way of building and designing is influenced by our current infrastructure, our street networks, and the rise of the car. And we believe that this, um, with this rise of more dynamic and uh, autonomous ways of, communi uh, of commuting and transportation, also our way our buildings have to adapt in the future. Um, we're um, at this point where kind of um, fiction um, becomes reality. Um, there are bottom up assemblages who help us. Actually, many we've seen today, or many ideas for this um, we have seen um, today, um, how we can create a more adaptable and flexible city network that also reacts to us um, in a more um, yeah, real time. One of the examples is actually something that exists out there already for quite, quite a long time. Um, these are two uh, screenshots of almost fully autonomous um, harbor scenarios where basically a complete city reassembles in like a 24-hour circle. So um, what our designs are trying to aim for as well is um, not only creating architecture but also implying the systematic thinking um, that goes from the whole production process also towards the reuse and recycle process as well so for the afterlife of each of our architectures. Um, and this is a project that also started as a student project at the university and at the moment um, it's already developed a little bit further. Um, it already almost like initially it tackled um, the notion of finding actually applicable living space in areas where um, you would not suppose it or that are not discovered before. So basically this is a modular housing complex um, which was initially envisioned for um, water sports uh, people, but um, then of course we thought like this could be also habitable for a larger amount um, of people in itself. So this was uh, created originally in the city of Kiel, um, where we identified certain network of application scenarios. So the project itself is at the moment um, um, advanced into a different state, also um, into a state of providing more um, yeah, providing more affordable um, student housing and providing more affordable social housing aspects. Um, at the moment, we um, kind of reduced, actually designed to the max, so we made it more simpler. Um, we applied a wood construction and also um, at the moment, we're trying to found a company out of it that combines um, a search engine for unused um, and reapplicable living space, um, activating AI. Um, basically a city mapper, combining it um, with this uh, social cause of creating uh, student housing and social housing. Um, in the initial concept, as you see, um, there were like certain methodologies applied that you would know from, um, let's say, space stations, um, car manufacturing, or in this case, um, also boat manufacturing, which is a big topic. We um, already um, looked in a couple of times with our hintergrid with our um, background from uh, car design, which is um, the notion um, of the um, structuring system, of the self-structuring system, and also the combination of um, many parts to a, um, a central whole. One of the um, ideas where we applied this is a pavilion proposal uh, we did in London um, for a pavilion that can be constantly rearranged um, by the users, so we had to ask actually our question when we want something that is actually formless and completely interactive, um, how does the initial state look like? So what we did is um, writing a, um, a custom algorithm actually that only took um, the landmarks, the trees that were surrounded by the pavilion into application, also the um, wayfinding and the circulation through the pavilion, and then um, build up different variations um, of the pavilion to create a cloud-like appearance that is um, basically not designed in a top-down process by any human. Um, yeah, all of these projects or designs are kind of um, 
result in planning principles that follow a non-hierarchical logic of organization. So we're basically looking instead of top-down or centralized planning parameters, looking at the designs that follow a certain distributed logic of order and supply, um, which comes through a number of um, projects and proposals that we've been working on over the years. Um, this was an ideas competition by the Land Art Generator Initiative in California, which was um, the proposal for public art water installation that should address the topic of um, water drought um, or the problem of drought and water scarceness. And this is how it originally started as an, again, kind of dealing with the idea of creating offshore land or reclaiming space that hasn't been used before in a modular family, in this case, a modular platform. Um, of markets and um, green farming platforms that are run and distributed as kind of a neighborhood co-op with a shared ownership um, and create in combination uh, space on the water. And the idea is that it's basically a self-regulating um, energy and water filtration system, which is based on the passive system of desalination and vaporization uh, principle that is very low cost and low tech and is being widely used in a much smaller scale in developing countries to create drinking water. Um, and the idea of this um, platform was that we have an architectural intervention that acts as a machine, but not a machine that is behind the curtains or behind cladding, but the machine and function itself is the platform that makes a technical process experienceable and tangible. So this process of purification and filtration is basically creating the architectural space. And the uh, functional principle is, we call it educating space, where it basically becomes tangible and is an added value um, of these floating platforms for people visiting um, it as a market space. And the idea of it being an expandable system or a modular system that can maybe basically be assembled and grow in scale um, was that the structures are not only sharing a physical space, but all of the infrastructure between the members. So there's a flow of energy and water between them, which um, creates an endless scalable system that kind of becomes more than some of its parts and can be expanded and adjusted. Um, so <clears throat> this idea of um, yeah, flexibility in Usage of flexibility in program is something that we've been looking at also in our um, teaching. This was something we've been, we've both been teaching in Ecuador and Quito um, with a group of architecture students together with the um, faculty for biodiversity of Ecuador actually. And it was um, a vision or proposal, a large scale intervention for the UISEC University um, that was creating a biotech campus um, for Ecuador, and the idea was that while there's one large-scale building in here, we kind of create a reversible setup of modular labs within this um, biosphere of reconfigurable research, like a village of huts that can be expanded, scaled up, and reconfigured with prefabricated um, lab modules within this shared, um, yeah, shared roof. So. It basically came back to, to the idea of housing the extremely diverse microclimates of Ecuador under one um, climatic controlled roof, ETFE roof, and then within this um, large roof having a village of uh, yeah, reconfigurable labs, of reconfigurable facilities. So um, basically allowing a flexible usage over the course of the year and also allowing that this yeah, um, biosphere lab can be um, both used as a research facility, but also as a preservation of um, Ecuador's dying species or Ecuador's um, uh, biodiversity. So this is an, some impression of these prefab labs that can be housed um, autonomous and freely within, um, within the building. Um, these are all kind of ideas that deal with the ideas of reconfiguration of space and the ideas of flexible program and usage of buildings. And we're kind of in a lot of the work that we've been looking at, looking how to translate these ideals to new paradigms of construction and building. Um, and we, when it comes to 
uh, making processes of flexible construction autonomous, we kind of um, facing a few industry trends, um, and they all face the same fundamental challenges when you translate them to architecture, the industry trends of automation, they basically come back to um, the idea of uniqueness of architecture or the highly customized nature of architecture in comparison to, say, industrial manufacturing, where every architecture has the ambition um, of creating a unique product or one-of-a-kind building and together with the technical limitations of scalability where an automated construction system most of the time can only is restricted to the reach of its machinery which goes kind of hand in hand with what's called skyscraper problem that means the practicality to build a machine of a skyscraper to produce something as an honor skyscraper so this is basically a, a challenge that under industry, um, industries face as well. Um, you see here on the left the, an example of the aviation industry where huge planes can be produced but only um, the extreme sizes are only made possible using robots or machinery of the scale of a full building, um, which is in contrast to trends that we've seen many times today. I think um, almost um, every lecture today had an image of the Amazon Robotic Distribution Centers, um, which is um, using less, a less centralized approach, but instead provides robustness and adaptation um, for unknown circumstances um, by scaling down the individual parts of the individual actors in the, um, in the assembly process. So and this is a research that is being done in the field of modular robotics all over the world in all the universities um, of basically um, yeah, small, simple units coming together to form something that is bigger than the scale of its parts, which we are interested in different scales of our proposal. And we kind of come back to the nice German word of the Verbund, um, which is basically means a multitude of... Um, both a compound of materials, but also generally a network or a composite um, of many things coming together, which we see as a certain correlated convergence of multiple identical building elements um, from the scale that we talked before of the mobility of the future to an urban scale. Um, we've been looking at this interest in the Verbund or the coming together of um, universal parts to him um, in some teaching applications we had. This was um, some work of students at the Bartlett where we were looking at component-based design and assembly logics where basically building elements in different scales and different porosities come together and give, while working on one structural grid, have a strong local differentiation of open structures, closed structures. Um, and we are we're also looking at very traditional means of construction, but employing bottom-up logics and principles. In this case, utilizing the most simple possible singing building element, just a simple standardized timber strut, um, but creating a new way of assembly through highly accurate positioning in space of the struts through non-regular spatial structures through a fully automated assembly system. So having a very low-tech component, a very low-tech building element, but a um, high-tech approach to assembly. Um, this was another project of the same group of students. Um, they were looking at a dual system component, so geometric properties that allow two systems to create together a flexible mesh with certain structural properties that um, is capable of creating planar or undulating structures. Um, it's basically two overlying um, component systems where in black you have kind of these elements that interlock to form a structural lattice and in color um, a system of shells that interweave to form um, kind of an ornamental facade around it um, which yeah, work in coexist together in one um, dual component. Um, so these are all geometric exercises of assembly and designing components that have a certain intelligence embedded to how they are assembled together. Um, a big agenda that we are looking at at our work and also the research work we've been doing at universities is um, 
this idea of autonomy and self-regulation automation. Um, so this was uh, a research project that's looking at growth logics, so at fully autonomous growth simulations and structures that assemble themselves. Um, and this was a study of basically a very simple bottom-up process of um, a voxel-based system of neighborhood, which starts um, structures that have no imposed master plan, but each cell is only a minimum intelligence of communicating its states to its neighbor cells. So it's like a neighborhood-based cross um, system where it starts as a simple 2.5D build-up sequence, but then we're running like several feedback loops where the system can identify um, areas of weakness and then reassembles the amount of blocks it has available to kind of create areas of extra support or without having a global awareness of the entire structure, it kind of um, communicates it from cell to cell. Um, the idea of this was also to extract numerical data from these cross um, systems where we can start to relate visual observations of the structures with parameters and ideally generating graphs of growth stability with the goal of predicting performance of either volumetric um, qualities or structural qualities already through numbers and data. So basically overlaying this numerical information that we have with the um, observation that we're making. Um, and we believe that these principles of small architectural assemblages can overcome a lot of limitations of conventional fabrication. Um, basically, the ability of materials and components to come together collectively and have something like agency, um, and meaning building through local interactions rather than a top-down control with potentially a more flexible or adaptive and um, scalable construction methods. So this was a research project I've been um, looking at during my time at the AA, which is basically looking at a fully distributed universal robotic construction system that interface uh, operates at the interface of mobility and architectural design and kind of serves as a IoT platform that augments the existing um, urban infrastructure with a, that enables architecture with a sensor as kind of um, as a plug-in. So we think of this as a reaction to the notion of the urban nomad, something like nomadic urbanism, meaning where the city itself can become mobile and nomadic and changes around its um, inhabitants. Um, so these were some prototypes that we built back then um, of this uh, kinetic construction system and the logic behind it of having a communication protocol of units only communicating with another and not following a top-down building plan and starting from a very simple single unit um, where each scale um, autonomously assembles to the next higher order and um, following a simple geometric principle of uh, one building block which um, can change its geometry based on rotation and movement and this way assemble in a plug-and-play manner to a higher order. So this was kind of always translating these principles from physical objects to digital simulations and creating kind of a feedback loop between the prototypes that then can, through communication between one and to the other, kind of create an awareness of their own building plan. Um, so these are some yeah, mobile bodies that follow this um, follow this construction and show, they're showing different behavior um, depending on how they are assembled together and basically here showing starting from a highly flexible like linear array that then fold into another interlock in the three-dimensional space frame and it's always about a choreography of small and localized low or low energy movements this then create spatial configuration where parts of the system are locking in and the mobility is used for optimizations by putting passive units and that are being lifted up among the structures, among levels, to um, create reinforcement. Um, so the system behaves according to different sets of goals that it's given while we simulate these, um, these structures, where basically it in real time adapts to changing goals or conditions, giving it a certain amount of, you've got, I don't know, uh, a number of 500 units and you've got a certain amount of time and then calculates what 
kind of um, how can I build a bridge with the amount of units that I have, or how can I build a column? How do I build a column if I've got an hour and five minutes, or how do I build a column if I uh, only have 20 minutes and half amount of the units? Um, so this is a kind of short, yeah, life cycle animation of how these we imagine these units coming together and aggregating, and yeah, all of these ideas I think that we were looking at are always coming back to the idea of creating some or designing something like a building life cycle that is not finite, um, both in our work in the mobility sector and in the architecture where it's about the ability to disassemble and disconnect just as much as it is about the ability to, to build. Um, so this is yeah, just some image of a further development that we've recently been doing for an installation in Poland. Um, based on the same project. And I think we're running over time. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, thanks very much.